Our next speaker gets four extra minutes from Mr. Kanaya's. Uh, we believe in this debit and credit. So you got to, I mean, Franklin Templeton owes you some, okay? Our next speaker is Mr. Anand Radhakrishnan, CIO Franklin Equity. Anand has nearly three decades of experience in the fund management space. He joined Franklin Templeton AMC in 2004, and prior to that was in Sundaram AMC and SBI Funds Management. Anand will talk on India's economic resilience, long-term perspective. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, Kamfa, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the esteemed speakers before me over the last one and a half days would have spoken uh, well and uh, good enough for reinforcing the case for India. So I do have a long presentation, but since I have only 23 minutes, thanks to three minutes credit from the previous speaker, I'm going to skip a lot of slides, but focus on few points which I think are very important uh, if you are an advisor and you are want to kind of strategize how you want to build portfolios for your investors. Uh, people ask, uh, is some of this rally, is it going to sustain? Does India have a bigger story? If, can you tell me what are the couple of stories which are very important in terms of uh, things? So I'm going to focus on uh, two, three points. One uh, key point about markets like India, which is a global emerging market, is that India is a very under-leveraged market when compared to the developed markets. That means average borrowing per head, either it is government, corporates, or households, is relatively much less versus the developed market, which is both good as well as an opportunity. Good because when their interest rates go up, we don't get hurt. Opportunity because if we can lever, lever up more, the growth in future years is going to be a lot higher than the past years. So this is the same thing in another way. The emerging markets, structurally lower leverage versus the developed markets. The orange line is the various emerging markets. India is somewhere in the middle of that between Indonesia and Thailand. Not only the leverage is low, emerging markets have very good free cash flows. Uh, high ROEs in terms of uh, companies versus the developed market compatriots. And its valuations are not significantly uh, at premium versus the developed markets. Uh, this is emerging market price to book ratio and emerging market price to book discount to the world uh, index. So emerging markets on an aggregate uh, are trading at a discount to the world equity markets which makes it a very attractive asset class per se. Now, um, again, in various forward P ratios in terms of uh, emerging markets also look fairly attractive. Orange line, emerging market forward P is 10.5 versus developed markets 14.4%. Now, second question people ask me is that how does India compare with China? In some of the recent times, China has suffered uh, because of the zero COVID policies, we have seen a lot of shutdowns in the economy. Now in 2023, they are coming away out of that shutdown. Now they are asking whether the money will again go back to China from India or from markets like India. Would that mean India will relatively perform poorly versus China? So now I want to look at India in the context of China. Uh, this is uh, Indian GDP as a percentage of world uh, GDP. The blue line is India's GDP, which is roughly three and a half trillion dollars. But most important point is the orange line, which tells you India's share as a percentage of world GDP. From somewhere in 1989-90 onwards, till that time our share has been coming down as a percentage of world GDP. From there we have seen significant improvement from close to one percent to today, within about 22 years. We are 3.5% of the world GDP. In another probably 10 to 15 years, we'll probably be close to 7% of the world GDP. And that is a very meaningful percentage. This is India on its own. The second way to look at India's significance, rising significance in the global scenario is, what is India's share of GDP and China's share of world GDP? If you look at it, or what is India as a percentage of China? 
If you look at it, where China was, I mean, 92, China was about where India was in the year 90, India is currently in the year 1992-93. It was roughly around 3%. Today it is at 18% of the world GDP. The same 22 years from 3%, they have become 18%. But most importantly, the size of India as a percentage of China, which is India divided by China as a GDP. If you look at it, in the year 1989, India was roughly the same size of China. Can you believe it? India was roughly same size of China. But since then, we have now become 20% of China's size. We are one-fifth of China's size in terms of GDP. But the good thing is that the line is beginning to change. Our relative size is beginning to change. The blue line, the light blue line, where it is India as a percentage of China has bottomed out at 20% and now we are beginning to relatively improve in size. Another way to look at it is, what is our growth versus China's growth? And how are we, how is the difference comparing? If you look at it, there was a time where our growth used to be 5 to 10% lower than that of China. If China was growing at 12%, we were growing at 7%. If it was growing at 15%, we were growing at 5%. So the orange line plots the growth differentials. This is five-year CAGR of growth, not one-year growth differentials. <coughs> five-year growth differentials. If you look at it, since 2016-17 onwards, the growth differentials have come to close to zero, which means in the last five, six years, India GDP growth minus China GDP growth is equal to zero. We are roughly growing at the same rate as that of China. And possibly in the next five, 10 years, this line is going to become positive. I'm pretty sure it is going to become positive. There are going to be years where we are going to grow faster than China. And that is essentially an economic necessity of the world. And I will come to why it is looking very clear. Now, when we look at India, we look at a lot of things, markets, PE, etc. But I think uh, the real story lies beyond, the, uh, in, beyond such numbers, economic numbers. There are good long-term themes when one, when one wants to invest in India, whether it is favorable demographics, leverage, more and more financial access to people, uh, economy moving from informal economy to more formal economy, use of technology, Ten years back, the same event would have been done in a different manner. Today, I am seeing a lot more use of technology just conducting a conference. Imagine this in so many aspects of our life, whether it is manufacturing, distribution, logistics, consumption. In every angle, technology is used a lot more today than they were about five or ten years back. Privatization, today when I was coming to this meeting, I just saw a news flash that uh, one of the state government, Gujarat, has uh, put many of its uh, PSUs up for privatization and that's very good news. A lot of companies which are in public hands are going towards private. And then a lot of upgradation, whether metros in various, uh, metro rail in various cities, uh, roads and other urban network upgrades. And uh, whether it is digitization, we are seeing humongous amount of improvement over the last five, ten years which have big long-term investment themes for investors. These are adequately supported by ease of doing business, efficiency, structural improvement in financial system, and then a qualitatively better way of spending money by the government. Now, I look beyond the headline numbers. What are the things that make this happen? I look at one or two, uh, two three more trends. A key trend is at what age people get married in India. I think this is very important, mostly un less understood. I think the higher the age they get married, the lesser is the population growth, the better is the education for the girl, the better is the participation of the girl in workforce, etc. The, the chart on the right hand side gives you that gradual improvement at the age of marriage. The chart on the left top gives you the dropout rate of girls from schools. Again, a significant improvement since 2014. I mean, people make fun of the government slogan called Bet Beti Padao, Beti Bachao kind of a thing, but it is showing up in numbers very, very nicely. 
the number of percentage of girls who are dropping out of primary level, secondary, upper primary level and secondary level, we are seeing significant improvement. And uh, this can be corroborated by various other data. Another data which is very heartening is more and more people are coming under social security net. New subscribers to EPFO. This is the data which is published by the EPFO organization. And how much percentage of them is from the 15 to 25, 16 to 25 year category. Again, we have seen a beautiful uh, improvement in more people joining the organized workforce who are covered by a provident fund kind of a safety net. The better the safety net, the better is the work environment, the higher is the productivity and the higher is the competitiveness of labor versus the other countries. The second uh, trend, demographic trend is availability of money. Earlier people were struggling to get loans uh, thanks to the opening up of uh, scheduled commercial bank accounts. You saw a big spike in the opening up of accounts. We are seeing uh, various benefits of it now beginning to trickle through. Whether it is the digital transactions, availability of credit and debit cards, number of insurance policies bought by these people, etc. We are seeing not only they are covered by EPFO, they are also getting covered by health and life insurance policies. This is again a very interesting uh, trend for protecting the downside for people who are at the lower end of the society. Third big trend, which I think is very important, is the rising trend of innovations. Again, for any economy to do well, it has to do a lot of good things. Good things is it has to do scientific temperament and technology. The chart gives you how many number of patents were applied and granted. This is again the, orange uh, the green lines and uh, orange lines give you how many numbers of patent applied by resident Indians, non-resident Indians and how many are granted. Similarly, what number of trademarks application has been uh, filed and it is granted. Industrial designs, again application and granted. Why this is important is there was a time India was very happy borrowing ideas from the western world, whether it is in manufacturing or services and mimicking it or copying it. Today we are seeing innovation happening at our own end. The biggest innovation we all have seen is the digital money or UPI transactions. India is one of the biggest country, country which has the biggest system of digital transaction in the world and this has been pioneered by domestic technology. It's not borrowed from anyone else, it's more or less pioneered by domestic technology which kind of speaks volume of the fact that Indians are embarking on the path of innovation a lot more aggressively in the last 5-10 years than before. Again, this I'm sure many of the previous speakers would have touched upon is India is rediscovering its, uh, its strength in manufacturing. There was a time people used to say manufacturing is dead in India, especially when China was killing the manufacturing sector, not only in India, it was killing the manufacturing companies across the world. Because of that, manufacturing share of uh, GDP uh, kept coming down from about 18-19% in 2000 to 14 and 15% in 2020. Luckily, government woke up to this reality, started incentivizing manufacturing again. We are seeing series of announcements regarding PLI in various sectors, including semiconductors, hydrogen cells, automobiles, defense, railways, pharmaceuticals, you name it. There is a government uh, program to incentivize manufacturing. Thanks to that, we are seeing a revival of sorts. People earlier used to have challenge in buying manufacturing company in the portfolios. Today, we are hunting for manufacturing ideas. We are searching for good manufacturing companies to invest in, thanks to the change in the sentiment and the pros prospects of doing better. This is showing up in uh, capex ratios, companies are spending more money on setting capacity. This is showing up in bank loans, banks are lending more money for setting up capacity. Government itself is spending more money on infrastructure. If you look at uh, infrastructure capex as a percentage of GDP, it came down during COVID, now again it is picking up. So this is again all kind of indicative that on a broad picture, we are making good progress. And this is a one 
favorite slide of mine which tells you many sectors are consolidating whether we like it or not lot of people you know we believe that uh, india is predominantly driven by small and medium enterprises and therefore it is very important to protect it but india also needs to build, build scale in specific sectors and that is showing up in this chart in every sector we are given market share of top 5 6 players it is true for mutual funds also in mutual funds also top 6 players would market share would have gone up in the last 10 years but in banking credit 37% to 52% top 6 players between 2010 to 2022 cement steel telecom aviation you look at any sector the the strong players become stronger and bigger the good players become bigger so this is very important if you are in an industry whether it is mutual fund manufacturing or advising we need to give good quality products and services and we need to do it consistently then it's it is inevitable that the market will consolidate towards a few good players and this again i don't want to touch upon this this is a most often talked about topic coming to the market um this year that is fiscal year 2023 24 that is next one year roughly we will touch about 1000 rupees earnings of nifty uh, i mean this is after a long time we are getting into that kind of a four digit hopefully and if you look at it the growth is beginning to now looking accelerated in the last few years i think again fiscal 20 and 21 were impacted by covid but 22 we saw a big spike 23 we are seeing a very reasonably good growth again in the current year next year we think that the earnings are set to touch even four digit of uh, eps are driven by various sectors not only banking and financials it will also be driven by uh, better performance from metals and oil and gas it will be driven by consumer durable companies like in automobiles and white goods and hopefully some of the beaten down sectors like healthcare uh pharma etc may also contribute to the earnings growth in the year 23 uh, 24 we expect 23 24 therefore to be a more broad based earnings recovery story wherein more sectors will participate in earnings recovery than in fiscal 22 23 so markets are well supported by earnings in the next one year this is the same thing put in a different manner that earnings as a percentage of gdp is beginning to show long term structural improvement now having said that is everything is rosy or do we need to be little careful so i think the near term is little getting murky despite good structural opportunity i think uh, globally central banks have been fighting inflation even india has been to some extent fighting inflation and our interest rates have also gone up all said and done and one of the key impact of higher interest rate is things will cool down whether we like it or not things will slow down india also will react to high interest rates and only way high interest rates impact is it slows the growth and we will see that uh, till we are seeing global inflation and global global interest rates coming down i think this is very important so while we remain structurally positive we also have to be aware that there is an air pocket in front of us which is going to not only hit india it is hitting the rest of the world second uh, air pocket which already we hit is our uh, trade deficit earlier we used to have a uh, close to trade surplus in between 2019 20 etc but now thanks to high oil prices and gas prices and others our trade deficit has again increased this is slightly risky it brings down your uh, foreign currency reserves and if you don't get money from foreigners uh, there will be pressure on rupee i think that is what we happened in 2022 where rupee came under pressure when foreign currency f- fell from 550 billion dollar to 450 billion dollar there was a 100 billion dollar drop in um, forex reserves uh, where currently it is around 547 billion sorry it came down from 600 odd billion dollar to 547 and because of that we saw weakness in rupee again if our trade account doesn't become better we will continue see continued pressure on rupee 
Third is all said and done, in 2022, domestic investors saved the market. And there was a massive selling by foreigners, and domestic investors poured in. The last bar on the first chart, the blue line is the foreign investors, and the red line is the domestic investors, and thankfully, domestic investors poured in much more money than foreign investors pulled out. Uh, luckily, the current year, foreign investors don't, may not be selling as much. But domestic investors may also not invest as much. They may want to probably invest in a high yield, fixed income security, or a fund, or an ETF, bond ETF, etc. So in some extent, I think that the flows into the market will become more narrower in the current year. And our dependence on foreign flows will in increase because as the domestic rates high and money starts to go back to bank deposits and fixed income in investments, the dependence on foreign capital will increase and that will be a third factor which is a nearer term headwind. I will skip these charts. And currently on, and then on the valuation, all said and done, India is trading at a premium to the other emerging markets. While emerging markets on a whole is trading at a discount thanks to collapse of China, collapse of Taiwan, fall in the index of uh, various other markets like Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia. But India alone is standing out in terms of valuation. No, we feel good about it, but at the same time, we also should recognize the higher the starting valuation, the less likely that you are going to make a lot of money. So your expected returns are going to be a lot more uh, moderate in the nearer term, unless there is a bit of time and uh, value correction that happens in the nearer term. I think this is, again, something we all need to negotiate and handle carefully. If not with the past allocation, at least with the incremental allocation, we need to kind of uh, take care of this nearer term headwinds. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I think I only used one more minute, one minute out of the three and a half minutes given to me. Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, paying it forward. So you have given it to Mr. Navneet Munot now, the extra two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. May I call on stage uh, Mr. Ramesh Biswas? Ramesh Biswas, the, yes, the, the convention chairman. Mr. Ramesh Biswas and Mr. Baliga from Mangaluru. And Amish Chedda from Bengaluru.